So, you know, I was thinking about this when I was listening to you talk to uh, Glenn Lowry. And when you talk about, um, you know, sort of the continuity of Western civilization, you know, a thought that popped into my head is, you know, we say things like, well, this is why Western countries are so great. And a part of me thinks, well, maybe there was this culture that, you know, produced the Industrial Revolution and, you know, brought America, say, up to the 1950s. Um, but maybe the people who live here now, you know, the legacy Americans, are just sort of chugging along based on what, you know, these much wiser and better people built um, long ago. So, I mean, I'll give you an example. So I, I, my family is a Middle Eastern immigrant. So like the extended family, the idea that anyone would have a child out of wedlock, the unthinkable, right? Um, I look at, you know, my friends grew up, they all grew up with, you know, divorced parents or parents um, who never married, or a lot, at least a lot of them did. And, you know, my, a lot of my older relatives, they, they, they sort of, their idea of America was like Westerns and like Elvis, and they really liked this stuff. And they're like, oh, you know, this is great. And they came to America, they're, you know, they saw some of their younger people, the different generations get into drugs. And they were like, you know, what, what is this? You know, they, so I, a part of me, a part of me thinks that, you know, like if you look at something like out of wedlock birth rates, right? If you look at something like divorce rates, if you look at something like attitudes towards sexuality, a lot of immigrants are closer to the America of the 1950s than Americans of 2020s are to the Americans of 1950s. So maybe, maybe the Western, maybe it's gone. Maybe it's gone. Maybe this is a great thing. We're just we're living off you know three percent growth based on those old institutions. But you know, there's got to be something new because the the continuity has just been broken. Well, there's so much to what you're saying. I mean, there is so much to what you're saying. Maybe my problem is I just don't know what time it is, right? I mean, we, we've just passed the peak. And, and of course, the people in charge have let it happen. Uh, there are people like Patrick Deneen who say the seeds of destruction are sown in our very kind of liberal commitments that we've allowed this decadence to occur. And it is definitely occurring. Uh, what you say about, you know, it's unthinkable to have a child out of wedlock. I mean, that's the way it used to be in my Jewish upbringing. It, it was literally the word is unthinkable. I mean, you would just never do it. Right. And to a certain extent, that's still true. That's one aspect of, you know, our traditional culture. But there are others. There's this weird mix of kind of creativity and stability of dynamism and traditionalism, this wonderful, delicate balance that we had during our heyday, and I'm very nostalgic about the, you know, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. Maybe that period has passed, and uh, you know, the West is is not what it used to be, and it's not gonna be what it used to be for all sorts of reasons. And we are gonna have to accept uh, some kind of successor population to kind of riff off uh, a Wesley Yang successor successor ideology. It doesn't mean it's going to be as good or better. I think it's going to be worse, frankly, because I think this was kind of a unique, magical moment in the history of the world that we achieved um, these pinnacles. And I don't know how we're going to, you know, reproduce that. Uh, I'm very worried that we won't. You know, the Jews have a saying, push cart to push cart in three generations. Uh, and there is that. Uh, I think. The Jews are emblematic of that. I mean, they really had their heyday, and now, like, they've faded from the professions. They they're gone from, um, you know, academia. Where are they? I mean, maybe they're just not reproducing, or they, you know, as I said, I'm indicted for saying they diluted their brand by intermarrying. Well, 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 some of them are. Some of them are reproducing a lot. I mean, some of them in uh, you know these Orthodox right. communities yeah. are, are really off the charts. Yeah, it's hard to. You know, it's hard to control these things. You know, I, like immigration restriction. I think I could be more open to it in a country like Hungary or Japan. It's like you know, it's it, you know, like the, the, the horse hasn't left. You know, the what is the saying? The horse hasn't left left the barn. You know, whatever 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 they right. say. You know, they still have. He hasn't you know, been turned into the boat, as the uh, Chinese say. But he, listen to what you're saying. I mean, this is very interesting. You're saying, well, it's too late for the United States to be like Hungary or Israel or Austria or Denmark. You know, or Japan, of course, you know, keep them out, preserve your culture, preserve your de demographic and all of that. But, you know, just 30 years ago, 40 years ago, our country was literally more than 90 percent white. I mean, we, it's the 1964 Immigration Act, the Hart-Seller Act that opened the floodgates. And that act was 
was catastrophic. I mean, you know, this was something people did. Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, yeah, you, I mean, you differ in our opinion of whether this was a good thing or a bad thing. I don't think on balance what that Immigration Act ended up doing, which was never anticipated, is at the end of the day going to be good for our country on balance. There are good aspects. There's a certain economic dynamism that has been introduced. But you have to ask yourself, is that dynamism just the dynamism of certain people displacing others? Um, would we have that dynamism if we'd never had that Immigration Act? I mean, you know, our, our salad days, our heyday was from 20, 1924 to 1964 when we had almost no immigration. I think it's unfair to say that those were, you know, bad years for our country. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the heart, you know, the heart seller thing is interesting because, what you know, you think about the distinction between U.S. and these other countries. And I think the, you know, the, the battles that were going on with the South and with, you know, they, they were, they, they stayed dormant for a while. I mean, you had the, you had the Civil War, but you were getting a white versus, you were getting a replay of the Civil War again, I think, over the civil rights movement. I mean, I think that the whites, whites in the North were uh, very excited about, you know, doing something about the plight of blacks. And I think there was going to be inevitable tensions there. So you, you're right. I mean, I think that you know we was it was already sort of a divided country. I think you had this uh, you had these north south you had these north south you know uh, urban rural differences that were going that were bound to blow up anyway. Um, but then the you know the the immigration the you know the, they they opened the borders and you know even though it was you know the you know this country was ninety percent white you know fifty years ago. Well, I mean now it's I mean it, it doesn't matter the the temporal distance right. So it was a hundred years ago. But now you know. I think half of kids born um, are non-white in this country. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's a, now you're arguing in immigration, you're arguing over, you know, whether you're going to be 50.2% white or 41.6% white in, in 50 years, you know, it, it's not, I don't think it's as big of a question, those demographic questions. Then if Japan opens a board, Japan goes from 99 Japanese to 90 to 85. That's a much bigger deal than the U S goes from 48 to 38, because it's already a polyglot. I mean, it's already a diverse nation and we're sort of going to have to figure out how to make it work. Well, I mean, sure. I get your point. I take your point. It's like the horse is out of the barn, but you know, the thing is, are you saying that diversity is good or diversity is something we have to accept? And I mean, if you say it's something we have to accept, well, if let, let me go back. If you I say diversity oh, is in itself, why not impose it on Japan? Why not say, well, Denmark, you know, you, you should open your borders. If, if you believe in open borders, why are you making exceptions for these places? You can't have it both ways. Well, yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not for open borders. I'm more of a, you know, pragmatic and I sort of take every country on its own terms. As far as whether diversity is good or bad, I, I don't like that framing because it really depends on the context. So uh, Ron, Ron Unz has written about, you know, there were some uh, cities in um, uh, the, the uh, San Francisco Bay Area where they became more diverse because the Hispanics displaced uh, African-Americans and the crime rate, you know, plummeted. <laughs> so in certain situations, you know, the, the places became diverse and they, they became better. Um, you know, if I want you know, if it's a swing state and, you know, I, I want the Republicans to win, you know, influx of Asians might be bad. Influx of Asians might be good in another situation. So I, I think it's just to say diverse. I mean, there's, I think the group matters and I think the context matters. I think to break it down into, you know, diversity is good or diversity is bad. I think it, it's, it's too simplistic um, in either direction, you know? So I, you know, I'm interested in diversity is a fact of it's going to, there's going to be some continuum of diversity we're going to have, um, depending on what immigration uh, is going to be 20, 30 years. You know, when you talk about like these Asians and their, um, their wokeness, it's not the first generation, right? It's the second generation. And so like an immigrant who comes here today is going to have a kid, maybe when they're 30, 30 years down the line, they will become a D DEI commissar. Well, if we're if 30 years down the line, we still have DEI commissars. I mean, we're in trouble. I think I think we need to be focused on how to how to sort of displace these evil ideas. And you know, the, I think the immigrants will I think the immigrants will go along with whatever the dumb. Even people in third world. I mean, it's amazing. Like you you look at Europe and you look at um, you look at uh, uh, you know, these places that have BLM rallies who don't have any black people. And I just, I'm in awe of American cultural hegemony. So I'm not, I'm not worried about, you know, immigrants are going to become more like Americans. I think they are. I think becoming, I think we need to sort of think about how they don't assimilate into the bad stuff and just bring out what's best in our culture. Yeah. Maybe that's, maybe well, that's all. Because they are assimilating to the bad stuff. That's, you know, the, the first generation of Hispanics have low crime rates. The second generation, not so much. Third generation, 
less so. So you have to sort of follow people out for the generations. But I think, you know, stepping back on this issue, it's a very, as you concede and you're right, 100% right, you know, to talk about diversity generally is kind of stupid because the devil is in the details, right? But that's the problem. What we have now is a ruling class ideology, which is absolutely committed to this dogma from which there is no dissent, which is diversity is always good. It's an unalloyed good. It's a wonderful, uh, you know, just a a glorious thing. Uh, We all have to embrace it. We all have to love it. And there can be no such thing as, hey, you know, uh, can we just, you know, hit the pause button? Uh, can we kind of step back and maybe try to deal with the immigration surge that we've had over the past few years, try to keep things the way they are more or less, um, nobody is, is, you know, advocating for that position, even though it's one that appeals to a fair number of people in this country. I mean, that's just shut out of received opinion, it's certainly shut out of the universities. Um, if, you, if you participate in any discussions on this topic in universities, there is one and only one point of view, okay? So uh, I, would, I would actually question that because I think there are downsides as well as upsides unquestionably. And I think ordinary people's feelings and intuitions you know, their uh, oikophilia, as opposed to oikophobia, their desire for, you know, familiarity, stability, sameness, um, traditional uh, cultural touchstones uh, and understandings, that those shouldn't be denigrated. They deserve some hearing. That's all. You know, I uh, I understand we don't not completely in agreement on this and it's a matter of degree. And it's also hard to know when I I get kind of confused about this. Well, you know, now that all this has happened and we have a polyglot boarding house, like what next? What do we do next? You know, uh, do we shut it down? Do we pull back? Do we, you know, just allow it to continue? It's hard to know. 